Now we're going to be looking at indirect dark matter searches. Remember what we talked about before was direct searches where we rely upon dark matter particles in our immediate environment to scatter elastically in a target material which leads then to signals which we can pick up. These are rare events, they happen maybe a few times per year per 100 kilograms and they require large detectors deep underground. Now for the indirect detection we are looking at signatures which relate to self annihilating dark matter, which um, is in some sense guaranteed uh, because we are looking at exactly the same process which was at work at the time when the universe was thermally producing dark matter. And so this cross-section is something which is rather, rather fixed um, given that today's abundance as we learned in the Wim miracle. So this is uh, nice because unless there's something which has changed completely the dark matter content from the earlier universe to today's universe, swapped it for example, um, we, we can rely upon this to work. So the only thing which we do not understand exactly is where the dark matter would self annihilate. So how much of dark matter is for example present in a dwarf galaxy. However, um, the cross section is fixed and that's nice. Um, in the case of uh, our parity violating models, we would be in most cases deal not with self annihilation, but we would deal with the decay of dark matter particles. And in this case, there's a couple of pop uh, com um, popular models which uh, consider the Gravitino as the best dark matter candidate. And then this one would produce uh, through decays a signal as well. And that's maybe then the only opportunity to see these kind of models. Now, in the case of um, self annihilating dark matter, we are then we can use whatever comes out of this annihilation process. Uh, the most important contribution that we can use is the production of antimatter. So, in the final state, we generate matter and antimatter in equal quantities. So, this could be a quark and anti-quark pair, and they would hadronize. And eventually, there's also some chances that um, you can produce in the end an antiproton. If you have also generated an anti-neutron, then you could get an anti-deuteron. So there's even heavier nuclei possible. But it becomes less and less likely. It's very difficult to uh, get a larger value. But in principle, there could be anti-deuteron formed as well. And this is also something which is predicted. In case that the final state is populated by leptons as well, uh, you may get positrons. And then positrons would be another chance to detect uh, dark matter. And we discussed that already in the cosmic ray section that we had before. While the charged antimatter does not point directly towards where it's produced, and we would be only able to pick it out on a statistical basis by looking at the antimatter which is produced in our normal cosmic ray interstellar medium collisions, um, the neutrinos and the gamma rays point back to where they are produced. And that's kind of an interesting way because in, a, in, the, in this case we would be looking at objects which are um, dark matter dominated, like clusters of galaxies or dwarf galaxies or the center of our own galaxy. And we would be then looking at these kind of uh, parts of the sky where dark matter density is sufficiently high to produce a lot of gamma rays as well as neutrinos. And that's, that's what we want to do. So here's, here's a little bit of, of uh, formal stuff before we discuss the observations in more detail. So the expected gamma ray signal can be written down rather easily. So um, when you look at a fraction of the sky, you would be, let's look at the sketch here. So you would be looking into some a solid angle. Um, that could be the field of your telescope or could be a part of your telescope picture which you cut out. So that covers a solid angle delta omega in the sky. And within that solid angle, you can just integrate lines of sights, and that's done here. So we integrate here over the full solid angle to uh, get the total signal in that solid angle. And since this is supposed to be averaged over that solid angle, uh, you divide then again by the solid angle. And for each line of sight, we integrate up the density squared of dark matter along that line of sight integral. So this is basically, this L is the path along which we integrate and dl would be then the position here from l to l plus dl. Now this is just a formal thing, but um, it, 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 the important bit to take away is that this, this thing will depend upon the density squared because we're talking about annihilation and that rate that scales with the density squared. Um, and this is more or less related to either our telescope's um, uh, field of view 
or to the patch in the sky over which the source exists. So this is um, this is typically about, however, driven by the point spread function, especially at gamma ray telescopes. And this whole thing uh, is often called the J. So don't don't um, mistake that for for, this, for the spin. This is called the J or J bar, um, and that is given often enough in units of mass squared. Perhaps you could also get a c to the four here, but c is equal to one here. Uh, so it's mass squared g v squared over uh, centimeters to the power of five because of this integral going over the squared of the density and then integrating over the length takes away one length so you get gv squared over centimeters to the power of five so that's something which um, we can we can we can get from astrophysical observations uh, we look at the dynamics of a galaxy and then we infer how much dark matter there is we assume some dark matter distribution how it is shaped in the central part where well, we do not know so much about it because observationally this is the most difficult part and then we get this number it has some uncertainties we can quantify that so this is observationally driven everything which comes here in the prefactor however is particle physics so we have here uh, the cross section for the annihilation and that's something which is fixed through the relative density observed so this is something which is around 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeters cubed per second, because this is sigma times v. And then we divide by the mass squared, and that's because we have over here the mass density, and the annihilation rate proceeds with the number density, so we divide out the mass squared here. And then we've got here a term which relates to the final state in which this uh, annihilation proceeds. So uh, formally I introduce here something which is called the branching ratio, so bi, uh, gives me the probability uh, to see a particular final state. It could be like a B, B bar or W plus W minus final state. Whatever whatever could happen here in this final state is summed up and is given some weights depending upon how likely this happens uh, in this particular model. And for each uh, final state, and for e I, get, I get a photon spectrum. So this is this DNI over DE. So this is the differential photon number per energy interval which is produced and this is also given an index i because in principle this is different for the different final states we will have a look in, at this in a moment now these are the terms which enter this calculation let me just discuss briefly how much we know about each of them so the sigma v relic density cross-section is fairly well determined so this has got to be this 3 times 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second and it has got some model dependence on whether there is some velocity dependence actually included or not. In the case of uh, S-wave self-annihilation, so this would be just a constant. In the case of P-wave annihilation, this would be like a velocity squared. However, this is in units of C, so this would be a number which is usually very small. Now the model dependent terms, that is what kind of WIMP I assume, what is the composition of the neutralino, for example, would be the mass of the WIM, that is a priori not known. Uh, the branching ratio, as the final states uh, are not uh, depending upon the composition of the neutralino, for example. And here, the number of final states which I include, this is an, an, uh, normalized such that the branching uh, ratio sums up to one. This, uh, the, the photon uh, distribution which comes out is more or less standard model physics because this is uh, everything after I create whatever fermion, anti-fermion, or W plus W minus I produce. Everything from then onwards is standard model physics. How this uh, produces photons in the end is well understood. So this uh, differential photon spectrum is standard model physics. So the only thing which is really model dependent is this thing here. And uh, this is something which uh, we are cannot set for sure. Um, and uh, you have to be a bit careful when you look at the literature. It is sometimes simply assumed that everything goes into one particular final state and then there's a limit quoted. So this is sometimes a bit tricky to disentangle. But in principle, we could, once we have a specific model we want to test, we can calculate these quantities. Now, the last thing is this rho squared, and that comes from observation. So that's astrophysics, uh, that's dynamics of stars. Now, the um, annihilation can proceed you know, that's model dependent, again, similar to the direct detection channel. However, generically speaking, you could have these kind of graphs. So you have neutralino, neutralino, and then you've got a spermion exchange here, and then you've got a fermion, fermion, anti-fermion final state here. You could also have a coupling like this, where you produce then uh, most likely W plus W minus in the final state. Or, and that's interesting, 
uh, because this is uh, spectrally very distinct. You could have a two a photon final state uh, via this kind of box diagram. And in this case, um, since this is a two body final state, you would get a line at the uh, mass of uh, the neutralino. So that's smoking gun type signature that is really unique because this kind of process is otherwise not thinkable. So you don't have any other astrophysical process which would produce a gamma ray line except for this annihilation. Whereas these processes lead to a spectral shape which is fairly similar to a spectrum that you would get in, for example, a conventional gamma, a cosmic ray accelerator and gamma ray source. So let's have a look at these uh, continuum spectra as an example. This is um, from uh, an earlier paper, but it gives you the idea what these spectra look like. So this would be the spectrum for um, a 500 GeV WIMP self-annihilating into BB bar. So this would look like this, and this is multiplied with E squared. So the spectrum drops, and then it basically has a rollover, and it would continue until 500 GV. Then it would have an endpoint, and there may be a little bit of a line emission at 500 GV. However, because this is a loop suppressed process, it's very, very little what comes out there. So it's basically not observable unless you have some process which suppresses these kind of graphs. And then this one is the only uh, annihilation channel, maybe. Um, for W plus W minus, you find a quite similar spectrum, even though the mass is the same, but it has some differences attached to it. And in the case of tau plus tau minus, you get a quite distinctly different spectrum, much harder, so more uh, photon energy is radiated away over here at the end point of the spectrum. And that has to do with the fact that the tau one uh, will produce um, leptons and they will do uh, final state radiation and uh, this leads to this kind of very hard spectrum in the end. Additionally, some of these processes will end up producing electrons and positrons as well, and they would then produce also gamma rays via um, inverse Compton scattering, for example. And then there's also final state and radiation, and uh, also uh, radiation from the from the exchange partner here, which can also play a role. And these are all interesting and higher order, and also higher order modifications that can be taken into account. But generically, the spectra look pretty much like this. Now, what observations are being done? Uh, we've looked into gamma ray telescopes already in an earlier section. Just let me recall to you. So we have, for example, the Fermi Lat Pair Telescope. This observes between 100 MeV and 100 GeV. And we also have the Imaging Edge Rank of Telescopes, which observe between 100 GeV and 100 TeV. So this is also then directly the mass range of WIMP particles that could be probed with these observations. And what are we looking at? Well, we can have discrete sources. That is, uh, for example, um, the dwarf galaxies, which are very famous. These galaxies have a huge mass to light ratio, several hundred, maybe even a thousand. And they also have this interesting feature that since the stellar population is so old, there's no gas left anymore. There's no supernova activity anymore. So there's no conventional cosmic ray accelerators. And as it turns out, all of these objects are dark in a sense that they do not produce any gamma rays in a conventional mechanism and then by looking at them and not finding any gamma rays can be quite sensitive because there's no foreground emission from astrophysical sources so whatever gamma rays you find are first of all probably good candidates to be produced in self-annihilating dark matter so nothing has been found so far and uh, there's also the galactic center there the situation is different even though the dark matter density is the highest there uh, there's still the problem that the galactic center, of course, has also other activities happening. There's a supermassive black hole there. There's gamma ray emission coming from uh, neutron stars. And so it's very difficult to disentangle what the contributions are. And the foreground emission from astrophysical processes it makes it difficult to find a gamma ray signal if it is present from dark matter annihilation. Then there's also the possibility to go and look at the gamma ray background as such, because in the universe there's, of course, everywhere dark matter presumably, and that dark matter should annihilate and leave an imprint on the fuse emission as well. So here's just a rough overview of what you can do. So there's the galaxy, you can look at the central part and you would expect, for example, some kind of spherical uh, gamma ray distribution which is superimposed on this band of gamma rays. Um, there's of course the point-like emission from the galactic center. There's all these dwarf spheroidal galaxies, none of, none of them is a gamma ray emitter, but uh, there's uh, patches in the sky where you can look at this and you will not find gamma rays, but there's a dwarf spheroidal there and therefore this is a dark matter candidate. You can also go and look at galaxy clusters because they're also having a high mass to light ratio. 
Um, you can look into galactic diffuse emission because these um, dark matter electrons, for example, generate as well Compton emission, and that could be uh, something you can pick up. You could also look for spectral features. And of course, you can look at extragalactic diffuse. So to cut the story short, uh, there is a few th observations which are summarized in this plot here. And this is now reported the um, cross-section sigma v in units of 10 to the minus 26 cubic centimeters per second. And on the x-axis, we've got the dark matter mass. Now, the uh, annihilation cross-section that we expect to, uh, to be around uh, to match the relic density is this gray band here. This would include all the uncertainties, actually. So this is really, really well defined. On the other hand, uh, we can do now these kind of observations. And the most sensitive observations at this point are given by uh, observations of the um, of dwarf galaxies. So this is this uh, grayish blue band. So everything above is excluded. Everything below is still uh, OK. And you see this band cuts uh, this relic density uh, cross-section at about 100 GeV. And then it basically goes above this. The next uh, observation is with ground-based telescopes of uh, the galactic center region. And this is a bit older. And there's a new observation uh, that we are about to publish. And that will basically bring it down to the level of this relic density uh, value. And um, you see also that there are some constraints that can be done using the CMB density distribution density fluctuations because any self-annihilating dark matter would um, change the temperature distribution in the CMB and would have an impact on the density, uh, on, the, on the fluctuations that we see. Um, and there's also some reported values which come from the um, uh, measurement of antiprotons with the IMS uh, experiment. So that's the yellow band. Note there's also a um, red region here, which is not meant to be a limit, but this is, uh, in fact, a signal region. This has led to some speculation. So this is coming from uh, galactic center region. And it seems to match quite naturally something like a 40, 50 GeV WIMP with the right cross section. However, um, this is, even though it's a um, very interesting excess, it remains to be uh, shown that this is really coming from dark matter uh, and not from a normal conventional mechanism. And a possible candidate would be neutron stars. And it turns out that some analysis indicate that this is more likely. And one of the ways of looking at that is if you look at the dwarf spheroidal galaxy signals or non-signal, you, you see that it's already cutting away some of the signal region here. And the most recent updated value, so this was from 2015. In the meantime, this has gone down and is basically cutting away all the signal region. Let me just uh, finish with a couple of comments. Um, which uh, should become clear from this and to take away from this. So indirect dark matter searches are guaranteed because this is a process which was at work to produce these particles thermally. So this would be in a self-consistent way expected. The uh, observations of uh, indirect dark matter searches um, is sensitive to the density distribution for the dark matter particles. And in turn, Basically, if you were to observe any kind of signal, this would be fantastic, of course. You'd be able to measure the distribution of dark matter in the universe. Um, the other nice thing about indirect dark matter is that it's working both for the self-annihilating and decaying relics. So the decaying relics, for example, like gravitinos, would be invisible for any other channel. They would be only visible through the decay process in late stages like now. Um, in principle, the spectroscopy of the final state gamma ray emission would shed light on the dark matter characteristics because this spectrum depends strongly upon the way that the dark matter particle annihilates and therefore what kind of uh, constitution it has. We can measure the mass with this because once you measure such a spectrum, you can determine the endpoint quite naturally and then you would know what the mass is. In the ideal case, you could even pick out the line and then measure the mass completely with a high accuracy which can be, cannot be done with anything else. The direct detection experiment would not be able to determine the mass within a factor of a few. There is, of course, uh, if you want to measure the cross-section, a degeneracy with the dark matter density, because the dark matter density um, uh, leads to, you know, it's, it's a product of dark matter density and the cross-section, which gives a signal. And uh, the nice thing about the indirect dark matter is it's completely complementary to other searches. 
Finally, as a comment, there's also astrophysical gamma rays as background. And uh, this is something which is bad in the sense that it makes it difficult to disentangle in some cases the signal. Uh, but for the dwarf galaxies, this is not an issue. Finally, um, to compare this with the measurements with um, uh, neutrino telescopes like Ice Cube and Antares, you see that this is doing this, done in a similar way. So you measure the uh, neutrinos coming from self annihilating dark matter, and you find that that uh, cross section uh, constraint is uh, poor by orders of magnitude, which is related to the intrinsic sensitivity of these instruments.